Lord, I want to be near you. Lord, I want to see your face. I want to be in your intimate mercy. Lord, I want to be like you. No one can be our conclusion on our series on mentoring and next week I'm going to start a series on uh, biblical counseling. I want you to understand that there's a difference between biblical counseling and pastoral counseling and biblical counseling is something everybody does okay and so uh, get prepared for that I think we'll have a great time with it uh, not only will you learn things about yourself some of you leave here saying oh me <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. But at the same time, you learn things about how to minister to other people. And so we should have a good time with that. Tonight, our closing series on mentoring, now what? Now what? Look at your introduction and your outline. We've covered the nine characteristics of a successful Christian mentor. These characteristics build the foundation for a strong mentoring relationship. Everybody say relationship. So, now what? Let's look at some scripture. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 1. The Apostle Paul is writing to his mentoree. He had been mentoring Timothy. Timothy is pastor in a church of contrary people and they were not cooperating with him because they thought he was too young to be pastoring but he was the best thing going at that time that was available to him so verse 1 in chapter 2 Paul says you therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus he says a very powerful statement there first of all he said be strong. You know, one of the things I find about modern men, and I'm not, I'm not talking about the men in this church, obviously, okay? But modern men are wimps. Moving right along. Going back to that verse of Scripture again. You therefore, my son, be strong. Be strong in grace. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ. Jesus. Now, that's important. Notice you, you asked me that question last week. But it, sometimes you read Jesus Christ. Sometimes you read Christ Jesus. Sometimes you read Lord Jesus Christ. All of those mean something different. It's not just a cliche, okay? And so when it says Jesus, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. That's what the angel said to Mary when she conceived, okay? Now then, the name Christ, he is the Christ. The word Christ means the anointed one with the anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage. And so if I say Jesus Christ, I mean he who saves is the anointed one that's setting me free. If I say Christ Jesus, I would say the anointed one is breaking all bondage off of me. If I say Lord Christ or Lord Jesus Christ I am saying that my Savior is Lord of my life are you ready for the next part I'm saying that the anointing is also Lord of my life did you get that you see we walk around saying I'm full of the Holy Ghost I'm full of the Holy Ghost oh, pardon me I'm full of the Holy Ghost and every time a crisis comes up we just fall apart then we call up our friends, and, oh, 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 you know, there's a bunch of wimps. I'm trying to be nice, I really am, okay. But I'm trying to get you people to realize, if we are going to mentor people, don't baby them. Hear them out, but do not baby them. Sometimes they just want you to baby them. Poor 
you, uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, it's, it's going to be all right. Oh, slap some sense into him. No, oh, no, 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 that's not the right thing to say, is it? <laughs> I love you people for putting up with me. You therefore, my son, his mentor, mentor, be strong in the grace that's available to you through the anointing that breaks all the bondage off of you. That's a powerful verse. Verse 2, and the things which you have heard from me, Paul the mentor, talking to Timothy the mentoring, and the things which, that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. Don't spend your time with somebody that's trying to consume all of your time and they're self-centered. Spend your time with people that are growing. Spend your time with people that would take what they've learned in Sunday school, learned in the pulpit, learned with you mentoring them, and go and minister to other people. And I'll give you a strong statement on that again in just a moment. Verse 3. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Notice it's reversed now. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. The word this is in italics, which means it was not in the original. So entangles himself with the affairs of life. That he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. This is very, very important. And it used to be more true as we were coming through World War II than it is today. Okay? But in the military, the idea is I signed up to be a Marine, I signed up to be in the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, whatever. The whole, the whole deal is the government's going to take care of me. The government's going to make sure I've got hospitalization insurance covered, all that kind of stuff. The, the government's going to make sure I've got clothes to wear. I may not like the styling sometimes, but the government's going to take care of me. And if I'm married and got a family, they will help me with that. The whole idea is I am a soldier in the Army for the United States, and I don't need to be tied down with a bunch of uh, incidentals that like the rent and the car payment and the kids and all this kind of stuff. I need to be free to serve as a, a soldier. When that soldier goes on the field, he's taken care of. They make sure he's got food, he's got medical care, he's got transportation, he's got ammunition. Everything that he needs, they're sending it to the front all the time. More supplies are coming in, more supplies are coming in. If you are a faithful warrior in the kingdom of God, more supplies are coming in, more supplies are coming in, more supplies are coming in. When you walk away from that faithful commitment, the supplies begin to drop off, and after a while you find yourself entangled in the cares of life. It got real quiet, didn't it? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Go back to verse 5 then. I think I needed to stop there. So let's go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. A few pages over to the left. Am I doing okay? Am I doing okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 7, Paul is talking to the church of Thess Thessalonica, and he says, in mentoring them, we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, our experiences, who we are, what we are. Because you have become dear to us. And from that point on, you hear Paul saying, Dearly beloved, dearly beloved. For you labor, brethren, oh, pardon me, for you remember, brethren, our labor and toil. For laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel, the good news of God. Your witnesses, God also the witness. How devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. It is so important that you watch your testimony. Watch what you say. Watch what you do. Watch where you go. Watch who you're with. 
Years ago, when I was a youth pastor, I did a lot of uh, object lessons. I was also a traveling youth evangelist, what have you. And I used to do things with black lights, and uh, that was the age of Aquarius, you know. And I needed a black light, portable black light hood, that I could use on the stage and put it on a pedestal, you know, this kind of thing. And they didn't make one, so I designed one. And I designed it with sheet metal, this sort of thing. I had everything just like I wanted it. And then I found a man that could make it for me. And I had to ride his case to get that thing made in time for a meeting I had coming up. And so finally I told him, I said, I have to pick this up on Friday. Can you have it ready Friday? I'll try. I said, no, no, no. I need to know, can you have it ready on Friday? If not, I've got to make other plans. Tell me now, can you have it ready? Okay, I'm going to have it ready Friday. So I called him Thursday night, is it ready? Almost. I called him Friday morning, is it ready? I'm, finishing, I'm putting the finishing touches on it right now. I'm going to have it ready for you. I said, when I leave my office, I'm on my way to a meeting. I have to pick it up. Where can I meet you to pick it up? He mentioned a bar. I didn't think anything about that. I'm not going in the bar. I'm going to meet him outside the bar, pick up my light hood, and go to the meeting. I have one of my youth with me. I pull up into the parking lot at the bar. I get my hood. I put it in the trunk of my car, and I take off. As I pulled out of the parking lot, the kid in my car looked at me and said, I can't wait to tell the youth you and I went to a bar. He would not have been lying. You see, I was under the stress, I've got to have this light fixed. We've got to get this done. The bar happened to be the best, closest, quickest route and everything. You need to watch where you are, who you're with, and what you're doing. Your testimony can be blown just like that. Okay? All right, look with me one more time at the scripture. Verse 11, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged each one of you as a father does his children. Three things, exhort, comfort, and charge. Motivation, okay? How many dads failed to exhort their children and failed to comfort that child in times of trial and motivate them to be what they have the potential to be. Dad, in today's society, is a disappointment. They're busy doing all kinds of things, good things, not necessarily all bad, or any of it bad, it's good stuff. but. They're doing it for the kid. They've got a job they're going to. They're working 80 hours a week to pay the bills and everything. So everybody could have their own car in the garage. You know, now we have three car garages. And when I got uh, time to, old enough to learn how to drive, we didn't even have a garage because we only had one car out front. And prayed every morning that it would start. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kids today feel entitled. Kid pulled up to the church here not too long ago in a $165,000 sports car. A junior in high school. No junior in high school needs a $165,000 sports car. And mom and dad is paying for it. But is that dad, particularly the dad, is that dad comforting, encouraging, exhorting, and charging, motivating that child to be all that child can be. And this also applies to church and their relationship with God. Too many times I hear, well, I'm not, I had religion forced down my throat, and I'm not going to do that to my kids. I'll let them decide for themselves what they want to do. I want you to know, while you're not forcing God down their throat, the world out there is forcing the world down their throat. And if you do not counteract what the world is doing, I promise you, your child is going to be just like the world and won't have anything to do with you and your God. Seriously, okay? 
All right, now, boy, I've gone to preaching again. Woo, I'm having fun. All right, verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God who called you into his own kingdom. That sounds spiritual, but no, look at the next part. Called you into his own kingdom and what? Glory. Remember the glory that came down on Mount Sinai for Moses? I want you to know you're called into that same glory. You're called into a glory that will transform your mind, transform your body, transform everything about you. And this is why it's so important that you recognize that you're being mentored not only by people around you, purposely or not, but you're also being mentored by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the greatest mentor of all. Jesus said he would teach you all things. And so as the Holy Spirit is mentoring you, what he's actually doing, not only is he bringing you into kingdom living, living like a king's kid, he's bringing you into the glory, the glory of God. That should change everybody's attitude. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I have one more scripture, Matthew chapter 28. And having read these scriptures, Matthew chapter 28 is going to have a stronger passion about it, okay? Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus is about to go back to heaven. It's been 40 days since his resurrection. It's going to be another 10 days before the Holy Spirit comes. He's given his final assignment. And this is what he says. Verse 18, all authority had been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, before I go any further with trying to expand or translate that for you, let me try this. How many of you have Jesus in your heart? Amen. Amen. How many of you are in Christ? Okay, what did I just say? I just said that I have redemption in here, Jesus. And I am in the anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage off of me. Did you get that? I'm a free man. And I'm a powerful man. I am a soldier in the kingdom of God that has everything he needs to get the job done. You say, well, preacher, I've got problems. No, you don't. You've accepted them. Think about it. Cast all of your cares over on Jesus, and he will take care of you. Cast all of your concerns on Jesus, for he is concerned about you. Folks, we need to wake up and realize who we are in Christ. And in mentoring, this is the kind of thing you need to get your people to at the end of the mentoring series to understand who they are in the kingdom of God and in the glory, the grace of God. So go back to that again. All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. If I have Jesus in me and I am in him, then all of that power and all of that authority is all together with me. And so I'm looking at potential out here in this room right now to do the things that Jesus did. And even more so because he said, the things that I do, you do also. And even more so because I go to the Father to make intercession for you. I am looking at a, a house full of warriors that can move mountains. Ow! You know, I preach, I'm struggling. Let it go. As long as you're struggling with it, I know who's not struggling with it, and that's him. King of kings and Lord of lords. Let it go. Well, it's just not that easy. Why? Because you don't know how? Control. I'm in control of my life. I meet people all the time, especially guys. They've got all these plans, and when these plans blow up like a stick of dynamite and everything, their whole world falls apart. Whoa, 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 whoa. You know, oh. 
Oh, we're having fun. Uh -huh. All right, look at this again now. Verse 18, all authority had been given unto me in heaven and on earth. In light, now I'm reading from the original translation. I'm talking about going all the way back even past this, uh, 1611 King James, okay? 1611, 400 years. I'm going back even to the beginning of that and what, before that. And it's, what he says is this, all power and authority have been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, in light of what I have said, go and make disciples, mentor of all people, baptizing, putting them into the name and character of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and nothing is said about water. Water became a church ordinance. Water baptism is a church Please don't look at me like that. Somebody said, what are you doing? I'm throwing away water baptism. No, no, no. Be baptized. But water baptism is a church ordinance, a good one. The Jews get baptized sometimes three or four times a week. You go to Israel, you'll find baptismal pools with stairs going down one side and coming up the other side. And they'll come walking down the street and, well, I need to get baptized. And they go walking down into the water and turn around and come walking up out of the water soaking wet, going on to their job at Walmart. People walk up to me all the time and say, well, I've been baptized. Should I be baptized again? Yes. I've been baptized seven times. I'm a good Baptist. I'm a good Catholic. I'm a good Pentecostal. <laughs> I got sprinkled in the Methodist church. The Church of Christ claims me. I've been baptized seven times. If water baptism saves you, honey, I'm going to slide into heaven like a... But this is not talking about water baptism. The word baptize means to put into, another translation is uh, to bury. And what he said was, mentor people, make disciples. And in your mentoring, making disciples, put them into, or bury them if you please, in the name, character, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The character of the Father is love. For God so loved the world, he gave. The character of the Son is sacrificial giving. He gave his life. And the character of the Holy Spirit is you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So if I'm mentoring somebody, I need to put them into the love character of the Father, the sacrificial giving character of the Son, and the power of the Holy Ghost. Mm, mm, mm. And Paul said to the... Uh, Believers there, and he met on the outside of town in Ephesus, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they said, we haven't so much as heard of the Holy Spirit. He said, well, what were you baptized in? What did he say? He said, who mentored you? What were you put into? They said, John the Baptist. Oh, he had a message of repentance, and he told them about Jesus, and then he did something Pentecostal. He laid his hands on them. And they started speaking in tongues. Well, that would scare the charismatics half to death today, wouldn't it? I have three friends. I know I can call on them and come to this church, and anybody they lay hands on in this church will speak in tongues. They have that gift. You know what the problem is? Not a problem, my concern. All three of them are almost 80 years old. Where is the younger generation? You understand what I'm saying? I have a fellow I have heard of, and, and I've talked to a couple of times. He's not even 30 years old yet. And I've been told he has that gift. But you shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. You understand what I'm saying? And so if we're going to mentor people, let's get them into not religion, not doctrine, not denomination, but into the kingdom of God and his grace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Look at this one more time. Therefore, as you go, mentored, make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name and character of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, mentoring, teaching them to do, to take heed, to observe all things that I have commanded you. 
Lo, I'm with you always in power and authority. Remember we talked about that earlier? Christ in us, we in Christ. I am with you always in power and authority, even to the end of the church age. Wow. Now, let me do this. Let's go to the outline. Now what in the introduction? First, respond with personal change within yourself. Anybody here an electrician? You're an el you do electrical work. Anybody here an electrician? Got one back there. Do you teach plumbing? Anybody here a plumber? Anybody here uh, a carpenter? Dear me. Anybody here know how to cook? Got a few of those around, all right? The whole thing is, if I'm a carpenter, I don't teach plumbing. If I am a brain surgeon, I don't teach delivering babies. How many of you are born again believers? Is that what you're teaching? How many of you are spirit-filled? Is that what you're teaching? How many of you have the victory? Is that what you're teaching? How many of you... Uh, check the lobby, please, shepherds. Uh, let's see. How many of you uh, are wimps? Are you teaching that? You understand what I'm saying? Okay? All right. Now, the whole thing I want you to recognize is you're teaching whether you realize it or not. You're teaching by your action. Action speaks louder than words. So check it out and see what's going on. Okay? All right. So look at your outline again. First, respond with personal change within yourself. Next, become a mentor and a mentoree. Don't just be a mentor, but have somebody mentoring you. The surest way to leave a lasting legacy, regardless of other aspects in your life, I don't care how good you are at anything you're doing, it is to mentor people who will commit to mentoring others. I am an electrician. I'm teaching you how to do electrical work. And guess what? You're going to teach other people how to do electrical work. Somebody has started out as an apprentice, and after a while, we get promoted to the next level and to the next level and to the next level. That's the way it operates. All right, now... Point one, the best mentor has a mentor. Be accountable to someone outside of your family. That is so hard to do. First of all, men have a problem with it. Secondly, women have a tendency to tell mama everything. Don't do it. She'll always side with you. Woman married to Billy Joe, and Billy Joe didn't do something right, and she calls mom and said, let me tell you what Billy Joe's been doing. Well, I'd, I'd slap that man of yours. I, I didn't like him when you started dating him. I don't know what you saw in that man. Why did you ever marry him? I'd take the kid and come home. We'll take care of you. Let him find something else. Hmm. But I just love this crowd tonight. I really do. Find you someone outside of your family that you trust. May be hard to find, but find them. I have a pastor that I've been meeting with every other week. We met some time back. And he said to me, I need a mentor. Will you mentor me? And I thought, I've got enough to do. Hello, I'm busy. I said, let me pray about this. The next day, the Holy Spirit jumped all over me. He said, that pastor is hurting. If you were hurting, what would you do? Mm -hmm. so I'll get on the phone. I'll mentor you. What did he do? He went and started mentoring another pastor, younger pastor. 
And the younger pastor said to him, you got this from that pastor over there in Azel? He said, yes. He said, can I go over there to that meeting with you? I don't need this, okay? But somebody told me one time, Pastor, your calling is to prepare pastors. I never thought about it, and I got to looking back over those that I have mentored over the years, and right now I have 42 guys out there that are pastors. Oh, okay. <laughs> but the, the whole thing is I got to thinking, man, all the people that are getting saved, I'm going to get some credit for that. And you know what the Holy Spirit said? And so is your grandma. Because she's the one that got you saved. Grandma mentored me. You understand now? Grandma was a, a gypsy fortune teller. She danced on the back of a gypsy wagon. She was the good gypsies. The Armenian gypsies were good gypsies. They were like the better ones, you know. They, they come on your property. When they left, you were better off than they were before they got there. It's those other gypsies that messed everything up. But she ran away from home, just a teenager. And she wound up in Florida. And a preacher and his wife adopted her. And she took their last name. That's why it took us forever to find out that she was Armenian Greek, because she had this uh, uh, Irish name, so to speak. They mentored her. Who mentored them? We don't know. We keep going back, going back. We're probably going to go all the way back to Father Abraham. We're all in this together. Point one again. Letter B. To get the most out of your mentoring experiences, do the following. One, seek someone who, will, who can help you ask the right questions. I don't want somebody mentoring me telling me I'm right all the time. I want somebody to ask me every once in a while, well, why did you do that? Or why do you think that's right? Or what's your reasoning behind all of that? Well, I'm always right. I'm never wrong, right? Oh, brother. Number two, decide to excel. This is talking about improvement. It's not talking about perfection. And do your homework. If they give you an assignment, or you get an assignment, do it. Number three, accept a subordinate position. Leave your ego at home. I know everything. Well, then why do you need me? Okay. Respect your mentor, but don't idolize him. I have to admit, I idolize my pastor. My pastor was perfect. Until one day. He's still perfect. You understand? How many of you are perfect? How many of you are perfect in Christ? That's what I thought. All right, moving on. Number five, immediately put into effect what you're learning. Number six, reward your mentor with progress, not appreciation. Don't go up to, I really appreciate you spending time with me. Oh, who cares? If you want to do any good, make them feel good, show them progress. You want your mentor to show you. The one you're mentoring, you want them to show you progress. They come up to you, well, I appreciate the time, but they don't do a thing you ask them to do. They don't change or anything like that. You're ready to wash your hands. All right. Number seven, learn to ask the right questions. Ask questions, have perception, and don't give up, don't give up, be a determined winter. Point two, step to effective mentoring. The process of mentoring is one, telling how, education. Two, showing how, demonstration. Three, getting your mentorees started, delegation. Give them something to do. Give them an assignment, whether it's physical or intellectual, give them something to do. And motivation, evaluation. If you're going to motivate, evaluate, I really think you're doing a good job. i tell you what I like about you. Number one, you smile all the time. Number one, you don't mind praising the Lord. Number two, you brought somebody to church. You're my favorite kind of person. Annabelle, you're not so bad yourself. 
I nicknamed, nicknamed her Annabelle, so that's all right. Uh, we can keep that going together. All right, look at your outline again with me. Point B under letter, uh, point two, letter B. When selecting a prospective mentoring, select someone whose philosophy of life you share. Um, that can get kind of interesting. For example, if I'm a school teacher, and I've been a school teacher, if I'm going to mentor someone, I don't need to mentor somebody that's looking out for physics. What's so interesting is this. When I was in, in, when I was in college at Florida State, uh, I was on the dean's staff, and uh, I got this nice room at the end of the hall, you know, bigger than everybody else's room, special privileges and everything, but it came with responsibility. So the dean calls me up and said, uh, Jim, we're going to send you a student that is from uh, South Vietnam. I said, okay, that's fine. What's he majoring in? Nuclear physics. Oh, I have a lot in common with him. And I said, why are you sending him to me? Well, he is a social misfit. He doesn't mix with people well. He has a tendency to get in trouble with people, make people angry, and you're the best I've got to handle in that kind of a thing. I said, me? My solution is go get drunk. And so I wind up with this nuclear physics major from South Vietnam as my roommate. We have nothing in common. What am I going to do with him? I'll tell you how bad it was. The night he graduated, the dean of men called me. I decided not to go to the graduation for something. I had some project going on. He called me at the dorm and said, where are you? And I said, I'm in my room. He said, where is your roommate? I said, I don't know. Why? He's supposed to be over there at the graduation. He's not there. I said, I don't know where he is. He said, find him. He's got to be on the platform. He graduated from Florida State at that time, the greatest and most honored any student had ever graduated from Florida State. They had planned on being a, doing this great big deal for him, and he's not there. The dean's panicky. The president's looking at the dean and said, what we're going to do, you know, this kind of thing. And so I'm trying to think, where, where, where would he go? Where would he go? And all of a sudden it hit me that he liked to study in the basement of the campus library. There was a little cubicle down in the basement. He could go down there and study. And I went down there, and I found him. And I said, dude, you're supposed to be on the stage to graduate. He said, that's not necessary. I said, what do you mean? You're supposed to be over there. You finished everything. He said, yes. And he held a book up, and he said, but I haven't read this book yet. Graduated with the greatest honors ever given by the campus. And he chooses to read a book. I physically picked him up and said, we're going to graduation. And I took the book with me. We didn't check it out. <laughs> I took the book with me. I got him on the stage. Now, here's where we bonded. I had some other guys on the floor that was about as bad as me. They just weren't as private about it. There was five of them. They were always doing stuff they had no business doing, getting in trouble they had no business, you know, get, just messing my life. And he could see that those five guys were giving me a hard time. So one night, he's studying on his side of the desk, I'm studying on my side of the desk, and these five guys are out here in the hallway doing their thing. He stood up and leaned over to me and said, with your permission, I can fix this. I said, go for it. I had no idea what he was going to do. He's a little guy. He's from Vietnam. I hear a noise. I look up just in time to see the bodies of fly, five boys go flying through the air this way. He's a martial arts expert. He put, <laughs> he put a whipping on those five guys. And I never had a problem out of them ever again. Because I had a bodyguard, you know, that was the way they were looking at it, you know, this kind of thing. Oh, dear me. 
<clears throat> but we definitely did not have the same philosophy. I was dating. And he asked me about dating. And so I told him how we American boys dated. He said, that would not work in my country. I said, well, what do you do? He said, well, first of all, if I go anywhere with her, her, her mom or her grandmother, somebody has to go with us. Oh, that's really cool. How are you going to smooch like that, you know? Smooch, is that, is that a word anybody understands anymore? Okay. He said, I can't talk to her. I said, well, how do you build a relationship if you can't talk to her? He said, well, if I want to communicate with her, what I'll do is she and her mother, grandmother, whoever, will go out on the pier. The, he lived around the water. We'll go out on the pier and sit down at the end of the pier. And I will begin to describe the fish. That is one real nice fish. If I was to pick out any fish, that's the fish I would always pick out. And she knows that I'm talking about her. I cannot speak to her. I cannot address her. But I can talk about the birds. I can talk about the fish. I can talk about the sky. I can talk about nature in any way I want to. And she understands that I'm relating all of that to her. Philosophically, we did not relate at all. If you're going to mentor somebody, you've got to have the same philosophy. Hello. Am um, I doing okay? All right. Quickly going through this. Um, <laughs> point three, beginning the mentoring process. Follow this guide, these 10, 11 lessons that we have done. Make sure you have your notebook. If you don't have a notebook, get one. I've got them out in the lobby. And get all the lessons, all 11 of them. Uh, they are available. Um, put into practice the character traits outlined in those lessons. Find a couple of people that will encourage and sharpen you. Seek out a mentor who can benefit from your life and career experiences. I'm looking over here at uh, Mar uh, Dartle. Dartle was financial aid uh, in the college there, and she understands how that process works, and the student wants to get a loan in the school, a financial aid in the school. She knew the process to help them. Was, you know, that's the kind of thing that somebody needs to be trained in because we're going to move on. The same thing with pastor in the church. I get asked all the time, well, when are you going to retire? Frankly, I don't ever plan to retire, but I realize common sense is I am not going to be this pastor much longer if the Lord doesn't hurry up and get here. So I'm really counting on him being here October the 18th, okay? That's a joke. All right, moving on. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if you heard what I said Sunday, you know what I'm talking about. But moving right along, the whole idea is um, look at people who can benefit from your career experiences, your ministry experiences, your parenting experiences, your marriage experiences. Make a commitment to that person. Time is short. Michelangelo, we all know about him. Michelangelo designed St. Peter Cathedral in Rome, the Catholic Church. But the priest, uh, pardon me, the Pope did not like him. He was somewhat of a renegade. In other words, he wasn't a good Catholic. And so, although they liked his work and took his design for St. Peter's Cathedral, uh, a bit of, uh, I better stick with cathedral. They hired somebody else to build. And that somebody else was smarter than Michelangelo and made changes in the building that made Michelangelo extremely mad. He was all bent out of shape, not only with the contractors, but with the Pope. Well, the contractor died before the basilical is finished. And so the Pope was told, get Michelangelo to come in and fit. No, I don't like Michelangelo. He's not a good Catholic. He's a pain in the neck. And they hired another guy, and that guy died on him. Now the Pope is getting older and impatient to get the building finished. So he has to humble himself 
and go to Michelangelo and said, I need you to finish the building. Michelangelo came in with an attitude, and he took his ever-loving time finishing it. In the meantime, while he's doing all that painting, he goes over near the altar. If I'm facing the altar, it'd be over on the right side by the door that goes out. I've been there. Some of you have been there. And he painted the, a picture of the Pope going to hell. Yes. Oh, they had a lot of fun with this. But the thing was, he took over a project that had been started years earlier. He took over that project at the age of 78. And to paint on that ceiling, he had scaffolds built, built up there and everything. And at his age, it wasn't like I can run up there and run back down. And so they had to pull his food up to him. Sometimes he spent the night up there rather than crawl down those steps and everything to go home. He even had what you call a porta potty up there. Sometimes he didn't use it, especially if the Pope was around. Mm. <laughs> in 1860, Anna Mary Robinson was born. And she died in 1961 at the age of 101. Anna Mary Robinson married a farmer by the name of Moses. His last name was Moses. Mary Moses moved from New York to Virginia to be with her husband on a farm. Her husband died in 1927. Mary was a very thin, petite woman, and she ran that farm for the next 10 years, her son helping her. He grew up on that farm. They got concerned about Mary Moses and said, Mary, you don't need to be doing this. So they sent her to live with one of her daughters in New York. Mary had 10 children. Five of them died in childbirth because she was so small she couldn't carry them. As she got older, Mary, to occupy herself, not being able to farm anymore, would do a lot of embroidery and give stuff away. Arthritis building up in her hand, she couldn't handle that anymore. And so her son, Will, said, Mom, why don't you paint? You're good at it. So Mary began to paint. And people liked her paintings and started buying them. And after a while, Mary Moses was not called Mary Moses. She was called Grandma Moses. Grandma Moses entered into a contract deal that was carried on by her grandson, Will, making Christmas cards and anniversary cards and birthday cards for Hallmark. And I studied about Grandma Moses in high school. And I started collecting her Christmas cards and birthday cards Anything that said Grandma Moses on it, I got it. Somewhere in my wild days, I lost them. But I came to Azle, Texas, back in 1978, preaching in the other building. I used Grandma Moses as an illustration in one of my sermons, and the fact that I had collected her cards. Sitting in the congregation was her granddaughter, who had married a fellow by the name of Ellis. And I think her first name was Mary, Mary Ellis. They lived out here on a farm, just out in that direction toward Boyd and Springtown. But she was 
built just like Grandma Moses, very small, petite woman. Grandma Moses gave her wedding shoes to her son's wife to get married. His son's wife gave them to her daughter who moved to Texas. And she's sitting in the service one Sunday morning. And I'm talking about Grandma Moses. I didn't know she was related. The next day she called my wife and I and said, would you come out to the house please for supper? So we went out to good old country home, good old country food, and had a great meal. After the meal, Grandma Moses brought me the wedding shoes. She said, I can't have children. None of the cousins want these. And I thought, Lord, who can I give these shoes to? I want somebody to appreciate Grandma Moses' shoes. She said, when you told about Grandma Moses and you collecting her cards, I knew you would appreciate them. She broke my heart. And I hold Grandma Moses' shoes in my hand. I told you that to tell you this. The mentoring process, Grandma Moses encouraged her son to paint, who encouraged her grandson to paint. Grandma Moses was a mentor, and she had mentorees all around her. And I stand here tonight continuing the mentoring process of Grandma Moses. You are a blessed people, folk. Jesus is our example. Amen? Hallelujah. Turn your lesson outline over, and on the back side, you will find a diagram. I want you to put your name right in the middle. If you don't have a pen, I have one right here I can loan to somebody. <laughs> Reading your mind. You better give it back. I stuck my name on it right there. You can't clean it, can't you? Now, up above there, I've listed four places for you to put somebody who is like a mentor to you. Who is influencing your life? An uncle, an aunt, a parent, a business person, a co-worker, a Sunday school teacher? Who? Last Sunday morning, a lady came in with her youngest daughter. I taught her in school 30 years ago. And she was telling me about all the stuff she remembers. I don't remember any of it. She does. You probably be ministered to her too. Sandra was a teacher in that school. Find somebody to put on that top shelf. And down at the bottom, I want you to find five people that you can sow your life into. You may have to lead them to the Lord. Have you put your name in the middle square? Can you put at least one name in the top? Can you put at least one name in the bottom? And now you have your homework assignment. Remember in your lesson outline that I shared with you tonight, I told you, if you have homework, do your homework. I will grade these next week. Ah, I love you. God bless you. Have a great evening.
Oh 